All right, everybody, welcome back in to Sports Money. This is the Pro Football GM version. I am Benjamin Parker, and it's a pleasure to have you on board with us today. We are going through all of our post-draft meetings, talking to different correspondents from different parts of the country. Tonight is the Seattle Seahawks. It is Brandon Holy. And Brandon, coming fresh from Seattle, how are you tonight, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Ben. Hope you're doing good. I am doing excellent. I apologize. I, I did not cover this uh, in our pre-production meeting, but I did pronounce the name correct again, I hope. Yes, right? yeah. So you're one of okay. the few people that I get it right on time every time. Okay, excellent. Brandon Holy from Northwest Sports Desk, and he is live in Seattle. Um, Brandon, how's the weather out there, man? How's, what's, what's Seattle like right now? Uh, for me, it's great. It's Seattle weather, so it's cloudy, and it's a nice 50 degrees, so I can just be chill. I don't have to be, like, it, it's kind of funny. It's, like, it's, the, it's in between now where it's raining, and then it's, like, an hour later it's sunny, so you just kind of have to be ready to take the coat off. My oldest son would love that. He's like, Dad, why can't it just be rainy every day? I'm like, why can't you just move to Seattle, you know? <laughs> it's nice. It's like it's not right. too high. It's not too low. It's just right. The Seahawks are coming off of a, of a really a big draft. Um, I don't want to say the biggest they've had in a while, but it's a significant draft, right? Um, quite a few draft picks. I, I think eight or nine if, I, if I've gotten the count right. Several good high-end draft picks that they needed to kind of get right. Before we walk into any real details here, what's your overall satisfaction with them? Um, just, just generically, how do you feel coming off of this draft for Seattle? I think it's what they needed to do. I think you're right. This is definitely one of their drafts that's the most important because now it's post Russell Wilson. So now there's more scrutiny. It's like, now what did you do with those assets? So it's a, it's a very pressure heavy draft for both the coach and the GM, but I think they, they did it by the numbers and they did a solid job doing what they needed to do. We talked about this in our pre-production meeting. It was a wild and crazy draft from even before the draft, quite honestly, to all through that crazy first night and even well into the second, third rounds. There's people moving all over the place. I loved it. But you just mentioned Seattle kind of went paint by the numbers this, this time. Um, but not a bad thing for Seattle. I, I think they did a lot of good things here. And you're right. I think there's some pressure on. But this draft really sets the table for the Seahawks moving forward. And, and again, like you said, I thought they did a great job. Starting off with number nine overall, left tackle Charles Cross. I call him a left tackle. We'll talk about that in a second. But uh, Charles Cross comes out of Mississippi State. He's the third tackle off the board in what was a top-end tackle-heavy draft. Um, talk to us about Charles Cross and, and, and Seattle. Uh, so everyone in the city rejoiced when Charles Cross was picked. Uh, we talked about Charles Cross a little bit on the last time I was on. He's kind of exactly what they needed, an athletic left tackle coming from the Andy Dickerson, who is now their new offensive line coach. He comes from the Rams zone run system. So you need somebody that's athletic. And honestly, Seattle fans didn't expect to get Charles Cross. I know in a lot of mock drafts, it was like, well, this is the obvious one. He's probably the third tackle and Seattle sits there nicely at nine. But everyone expected the Seahawks to go in their usual way where they overthink it. And they're like, no, our guy's going to be Trevor Penning because he can run block the best run blocker in the class. So when it was Cross, everyone's like, OK, that's an excellent start. You got your you know, your young 21 year old left tackle moving on from Dwayne Brown, it looks like who's a free agent. So you've got a core position. One of those high like priority positions is now set for the next decade plus. So that was a good start to the draft. Quick aside here, quick rabbit trail. I don't think it's unusual for people who have a fair amount of intelligence in their prospective careers to overthink things and outsmart mm. themselves. I, I'm not sure that we haven't seen Bill Belichick, even as fantastic as he is. I'm not sure we haven't seen Belichick do it quite a number of times over the years too. So it's interesting that you talk about Seattle now that we're starting to take a, a stronger look at them here, uh, maybe overthinking some things, but uh, like you said, didn't seem to do it this time. So the take what seemed to be the obvious thing was Charles Cross here at left tackle, number mm -hmm. nine overall at Mississippi State. We won't spend long on that. Real quick question though, with Charles Cross, Everybody's got him projected at left tackle, but now that we're down to business here in Seattle, do you think he starts right away at left tackle? Do you think he starts at right tackle? What's the feeling there? 
Sounds like uh, Pete Carroll and John Schneider in the press conference, they definitely expect him at left tackle immediately. So they seem really high on him. So it sounds like he'll be ready and plugged in there. There's not a lot of depth at tackle. So his only competition is Stone Forsyth, who was a six-round pick last year in the draft for the Seahawks. He's one of their three picks in the draft. So he doesn't really have a lot of competition, and it's a lot of turnover. So it sounds like he'll learn by – He'll get his experience. He'll be, you know, christened by the fire. I think it's a perfect time to just go ahead and drop in the two free agents that we were going to talk about anyway, since we're right here talking about left tackle, right tackle. Uh, free agent Dwayne Brown, I think he's 36, 37 years old, something like that. He's, he might he's, be 38. He's, yeah, he's up yeah. there. <laughs> After a while, who, who cares? Right? <laughs> yeah, when you're that uh, high, you're just late yeah. 30s. <laughs> Um, and then Brendan Shell, who's been a, you know, not not as good, but been a solid tackle as well over the years. Um, they're both free agents. Uh, my, my, I have two questions. One, how good are they still at this point in their careers? What do they have to offer? And B, or two, is there any chance that they actually re-sign with Seattle or are they gone for good? I'll start with Dwayne Brown. He is uh, definitely still a good left tackle. The problem is he is up there, so he's losing a step, and you can see the decline. But I think he'll have a lot of – he'll have a good market, especially once the season starts going, and if there's any injuries, he'll be the first one called. The thing with the Seahawks is you don't have a franchise quarterback anymore, and you just drafted a young 21-year-old, so you can save a lot of money and just move on. But, yeah, definitely a team like the Colts. I know they drafted some tackles, but if they needed, you know, they want Matt Ryan to have somebody who's, you know, a good veteran, like somebody like that, like a team like that, that they're ready to win now. Dwayne Brown would fit well. Brandon Shell, he may still have a chance to return to Seattle. I know he has he had some interest from the Broncos after Russell Wilson got traded there. They brought him in for physical, but ultimately they signed somebody else. He was very good for Seattle in his two years. The problem was injuries, and he just couldn't stay on the field. So last year, he was, you know, basically just sharing that spot with an undrafted free uh, rookie free agent. So he's good. He's somebody I would probably put as a backup, you know, like a, a starter when this, when a starter goes down. You have that experience, but you wouldn't want to rely on him as a starter because of health concerns the last couple of years. We'll revisit tackle again here in a couple of picks, but that mm-hmm. that puts us in a good spot to just move right on into pick number 40 here. Uh, we'll push the offensive line to the side for just a second. Pick number 40 is a guy named Boye Mafe uh, from Minnesota. Now, Mafe is a fascinating pick to me. There were a lot of mocks early on that had Mafe squarely in the first round, and, mm-hmm. and then as we got closer to the draft itself, it seemed like he was slipping. And what I noticed about Mafe, seemingly consistent, was – um, the talents there and the athleticism, but he's also a little raw and somebody's going to have to coach him up. So talk us through a little bit more about uh, Mafe and how he may or may not fit there in, in Seattle. Yeah, I think Seattle's definitely happy. You're 100% right. Like a lot of mock drafts, everyone had him as like a borderline first rounder. They had Evie Ketty as a first rounder too. So when right. both those names were sliding, Seattle was in a really good position. The Falcons ended up trading up past Seattle. So who knows if Evie Ketty was their first choice. But they did bring in Boye Mafe for a visit. He was one of the, I think, the 30 rookies that flew out to Seattle. So he had the pre-draft visit there with Seattle. So they clearly liked him. Uh, He seems exactly like a Seahawk kind of guy, meaning he's just pure athleticism and doesn't have necessarily the production to back it up. You think at Minnesota you would have more sack numbers than he did, but the fact that he's – just the right size. He's like, what, six foot four, 250, can run a four or five. I think they just look at the tools and they're like, we can work with that. Uh, a lot of people have some hesitancy, some concerns because he's an older rookie. I think he'll be 24 when the season starts underway or like at some point, like November. So a lot of people were worried about age, but this was one of those drafts where, since it's the COVID years, a lot of college players return to come out of the draft. So going to have that but I think with the athleticism and the position they need it was another premium position they really wanted to fix the lines and they're going to a 3-4 defensive scheme so he can be an outside linebacker he fits very well they have two starters already so it sounds like when the season starts he'll just be a situational pass rusher and he can come along slowly 
that's something I like. I, I'm not necessarily a huge fan of taking project kind of guys, say, in the top 40 picks. Mm -hmm. But to me, that really depends on the franchise that you have. The more stable franchise you have that has the ability to actually teach these guys, and then the seemingly, I guess, the wisdom, if you want to call it, to kind of put them in a spot where they're going to succeed and not be, you know, uh, kind of sore thumb sticking out. A place like Seattle, I, I like him going to a place like Seattle. I would have liked him maybe going to the Patriots or the Steelers, some of those franchises that really seem to know how to kind of coach up a guy. So, so I like it a lot better here than I would have liked it in a lot of places across the NFL. Um, right after that, pick 41, Kenneth Walker, uh, running back from Michigan State. Um, talk us. I, I've got lots of opinions on Walker, but I want to hear yours tonight. Talk us through uh, Kenneth Walker, running back. My opinion is I thought it was a great pick because some had him as the number one running back and Seattle is desperate to be a run the ball team. A lot of people think they want to run it 80% of the time, but Pete Carroll's always talks about how he wants balance. He wants that 50, 50, but at the end of the day, uh, they only have Rashad Penny, Chris Carson. It sounds like he may not even return and play football again with that neck injury. And so they only have one running back that's a starter level Rashad Penny on a one-year contract that they know will start the season. So it made sense to grab a running back. I know a lot of Seattle fans wanted them to take a third or fourth or fifth round running back for positional value purposes. But I think Seattle looked at it like this is the best running back in the class. We can take him right now and we can get back to running the ball. So it made sense, but I know positional value wise, some people were upset about it, but Look, if you want to run the ball, make sure you have the pieces to run the ball. So if you're going to do what you're going to do, invest in what you need. And a running back is important to run the ball. I agree. You know, I'm still struggling to look up at the Raiders and see why they already had two or three good running backs and added, I think, one or two more in the draft. Right. Zemir but when Ryan I look at – yeah, exactly. <laughs> when I looked at Seattle, I see exactly what you said there at the running back spot. You have a guy who – one guy's hurt. The other guy's contract runs out. They both, by the way, are in the five and six million dollar category, which is kind of a good bit of money to devote to the running back position. So I could totally understand why they got Kenneth Walker. And by the way, I thought there was a pretty big drop off in running backs after Brees Hall and Kenneth Walker. Um, not to say somebody else can't play in the NFL, but to me, I, I thought there was a pretty good drop off here. So I liked it. Kenneth Walker is a tough runner between the tackles. We've seen him have big games against big time competition. I really liked it here. Um, if even, I, I know it's at 41. It's, you know, mid-second round. I liked it for Seattle, personally. Yeah, it, it made sense because, like, the first three picks, it's offensive line, defensive line, and let's run the ball. And that's exactly where they want to be. They just want to play defense and control the game. So it, it made sense. They had their logic. May, some people may disagree with it, but at least they're spending the resources to get to where they actually want to play the game their way. I agree. And I've said this before. We said it during some of our mock drafts that we did. I understand why some people don't want to draft certain positions at certain parts of the draft. But if you like the guy, get the guy. Um, and the good franchises seem to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, third round, offensive tackle Abraham Lucas out of Washington State. Uh, this is a guy that I actually know very little about. I haven't broken down a lot of film on him at all. So talk to us about Abraham Lucas. So – Everyone in Seattle loves him because he is the local boy. I mean, he lives near me, kind of grew up around me type. Like, I uh, went to Washington State, so very local guy. He's like Charles Cross in the fact that he went to Wazoo and was coached up by Mike Leach and was in that air raid pass system. He's a right tackle, so the draft made sense. You get your left tackle, and then you get your right tackle. In the past, Seattle would draft offensive linemen and they would just move them around like this right tackle will be a right guard and then he'll end up at center. So it made a lot of sense for Seattle to just play it simple. Here's a left and right tackle. Some people are kind of curious because you get two passing tackles and you want to run the ball. But I think they look at it like we they were just they happen to be in the air raid system. That doesn't mean they can't run the ball. But yeah, he's like Charles Cross. We're in that air raid system taught by Mike Leach. The only concern would be he maybe doesn't have quite that anchor you want. Maybe somebody can, you know, get by him and push him and bull rush him. But for a third round right tackle, it seems like he'll be starting. He'll just be slotted in there as well. And you'll just bookend your offensive line with two rookie tackles. 
And it just makes a lot of sense to learn and just go forward with two rookies and just completely rebuild the offensive line because those were the two weakest positions going into the draft and they addressed it early. I love the concept. Again, I'm not super familiar with Lucas other than the, the, what, largely what you've just told us. The concept wise, I love it. You get two young guys there at tackle, even if they're both just decent starters moving forward. I think though, I think certainly uh, cross can be better than just a decent starter, but even yeah. if that's all they are, that's a good payoff here. And, and you know, you kind of set for the next few years. Um, very quickly, just a quick glance at the offensive line and then we're done with it for the night. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to call out a few names. Um, Gabe Jackson, Stone Forsyth, who you already mentioned, Austin Blythe possibly at center. Um, it starts to run pretty thin after that. Maybe Damian Lewis at guard. Um, are the Seahawks done adding to the offensive line this offseason? Do you think they're kind of – this is what we got for the year? Or do you see them actually maybe even picking up another piece somewhere in the interior uh, before the season starts? I think they got their starters lined up and written in chalk. Because if you go left or right, you got your Charles Cross at left tackle – uh, Damian Lewis, who's been uh, who was a like second or third round pick for them a couple years ago. He's been at left guard since last year. And then Austin Blythe, like you said, they just picked him up. Uh, again, a Rams, a former Rams center, so he can run that zone scheme. So they completely did rebuild the line, getting three starters, it seems like. And then on the right side, you got Gabe Jackson, who they traded for last year, who can pull and block and run the second level. And then at right tackle, you got Abe. Lucas there so it seems like yeah you got your left tackle center and right tackle in the offseason and they're all good zone athletic linemen so it seems like that'll be your starter you are right it is thin so I'm sure they'll add maybe like an interior journeyman lineman to like get some depth there but that will be the starters going into the season which honestly may be an improvement which may sound kind of crazy having two rookies and kind of just this backup level center, but that's how bad the offensive line has been. And they will at least all be scheme ready and a scheme fit. So I think they're really banking on that. It's a new day and a new age here for Seattle. And we're seeing it, you know, kind of a microcosm there with the offensive line. Fourth round offensive line. We're moving past that. Kobe Bryant from Cincinnati, cornerback. Um, I, I'm calling him a corner, but you can tell us where he really might end up, what position he might play there in the, in the defensive backfield. But just a quick aside here, Cincinnati here had, I think, I don't know, four or maybe five guys drafted off this defense. They, mm-hmm. they had uh, Brian Cook at safety, went to Kansas City. Of course, everybody knew about Ahmad Gardner, uh, who went to uh, the Jets. And, and there was another guy, I, I think a linebacker, maybe Darian Beavers, who got drafted as well. Um, that Cincinnati defense had just an amazing number of, of guys drafted this year. Kobe Bryant is one of them. So talk to us a little bit about uh, what we might see out of him. So this is probably my favorite pick, honestly. Uh, It's another four, like a fourth round cornerback. They do well with late round cornerbacks. The reason it's interesting, because if you want like read mock drafts early, everyone, you know, a lot of writers would have sauce Gardner going to Seahawks at nine because he just made sense. He's this tall corner who didn't give up any touchdowns. He would fit Seattle's old Legion of Boom, you know, like stats, uh, height, weight, speed. But I love Kobe Bryant because he kind of fits that chip on your shoulder type player where in Cincinnati, he was the one they were attacking because they didn't, they did not want to pass to Sauce Gardner. So he kind of got this edge to him. Like, I'm not a, I'm not the weak link. He ended up winning the Jim Thorpe Award in college. So he's battle-tested because they he had that big name on the other side of him, which that's usually how Seattle's Legion of Boom defense would be. No one wanted to attack Sherman, so they all try to attack the second corner, whether that was Browner, Byron Maxwell. So getting the second corner from Cincinnati that has a chip on his shoulder just seems like the perfect fit for Seattle. And it sounds like he'll definitely be corner. And honestly, he has a good chance to start because the cornerback room doesn't have a lot of big names. It just kind of seems like they're a pack of dogs and they're going to throw out the positions like they're up for grabs. So whoever is the nastiest one will get it. When you look at Kobe Bryant, do um, you think there's a good chance he may start this this offseason, but I love what you just told us about the, the attitude there, the chip on the shoulder mindset, because you're right. It's so 
and I know you can't reconstruct the Legion of Boom. That's a once in a lifetime thing, but it's at least reminiscent of that mindset and the attitude that I'm sure they want to bring back there. And my question right. is, and, and to me, this is always fascinating. You see this all, the, all over the NFL. Seattle has done well with some of those late round defensive backs um, over the past few years. Do you think that's because of the scheme that they run? Or do you think it's because of their defensive backs coach is just good at teaching these guys? Um, or is it just, is it just uh, Schneider has a feel for this in the draft? What do you, what do you think is really kicking them there? I think a big reason would be, well, Pete Carroll is a defensive back coach when he started his NFL career. So Pete Carroll definitely, I'm sure, is hands-on when it comes to the corners. Uh, they even got a new defensive back coach this year, Carl Scott, who's been working with the Vikings and he's come from the Alabama system. So they definitely wanted to develop their corners. Lately, they've kind of, you know, been hitting the skids, I guess, since the Legion of Boom. They've had good corners like DJ Reed, who just got paid to go to the Jets, or Shaquille Griffin, who went to the Jaguars. But it just seems like they want to, you know, get back, re build the room, build the room up from the ground. And they got a couple pieces from last year and this year. So they're definitely going young and hungry, I think. Kobe Bryant may not have the athleticism, but he just seems to have that mind and attitude that they want. And I think that's, I think they think they can teach up a corner if he has the right intelligence and skill set. So I think that's been their big reason why they've been successful, just grabbing like a waiver wire pickup like DJ Reed, who will then go get paid $10 million. I think it's a huge deal at defensive back because everybody needs one. And even if the guy isn't athletic enough to be a shutdown kind of a guy, if he can just make life difficult on the quarterback and the wide receiver combination, that's enough. That's mm -hmm. enough to get your defense through. You, you know, you might not be able to shut down all of these big receivers and these fast guys. But again, just making life tough and having the confidence to do that. I've seen that quite a bit with some other teams as well. I'm going to list you four more names here. We, we don't have to cover all of them, but just uh, whatever stands out to you. Uh, cornerback Tariq Woolen from University of Texas, San Antonio, the Roadrunners, who happen to have more draft picks this year than the Texas Longhorns. Um, defensive end Tyreek Smith in the fifth round from Ohio State. Wide receiver Bo Melton from Rutgers. And also in the seventh round, wide receiver Derek Young from Lenora Ryan over in my part of the country. Um, anything to stand out to you there about somebody who is either interesting or you think, hey, they've got an excellent shot to make an impact sooner rather than later? I think definitely the first name that comes to mind is Tariq Woolen. Uh, he seems to be the opposite of Kobe Bryant. And what I mean by that, it seems with Kobe Bryant, they're like, we want somebody with that mindset and intelligence. And Tariq Woolen was like, we want somebody with that freak athleticism and maybe we can develop that. And then we just hit a home run. So it kind of, they went both sides of it. They're like, we either hit this way or we can hit it this way, which I kind of liked. Because Tariq Woolen is huge. He's 6'4". I forgot how fast he can run the 40, but it was something ridiculous. He, he's basically like the cornerback version of DK Metcalf. And to me, that's just exciting that you got two cornerbacks in the same round, like back-to-back, -back, where it was like, all right, we got our guy that we think has the chip on his shoulder and can read the defense and the coverages and all that. And then we got our project that if it works, we look like geniuses again. And I think that's really fascinating, kind of covering both grounds. I love it. And I, I love Pete Carroll and John Schneider dipping back in here to the defensive back pool, uh, certainly what you've just mentioned. And what we've seen, you know, those defensive backs for years and years, you talk about Richard Sherman and Cam Chancellor, and, and there were others. But, boy, it really highlighted the back part of that defense. So I like them maybe even, you know, you can't rebuild it, but I like them trying to reconstruct something that seems to work for them again in Seattle. I didn't ask you this in pre-production, but I, I'll go ahead and ask you now. Was there anything at all, and by all accounts, this was a good draft in the Seahawks, but was there anything at all that you, A, would have done differently, or B, just a guy you were really hoping that they would get that they didn't get? Um, either case there for you? Uh, you know, when it comes to being different, no, I think they did what they needed to do. I honestly thought they would get trade down a bunch, and it seems like John Snyder really wanted – to trade down it just sounds like all the offers weren't great because if Detroit was able to come up like 20 spots to get Jameson Williams it sounds like trade it was the year to trade up and not trade down so I think they played it they played it right they didn't just trade down to trade down they looked at the values if you look at like a value chart they got 
everything right for like the first year. Usually they reach, it's like, we like Jordan Brooks. So we're going to reach, even if he has a second round grade, we're going to draft him in the first round. Not that they're bad players. It's just like maybe value wise, you can get them later and just kind of fool everyone that way and just, you know, get that value. But it seems like, like this year, they're like, we're going to take the left tackle where he's supposed to be taken. Boye Mafe slips, so we're going to take him. The first running back's off the board, so we'll get the second one. And everything just kind of click, 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 where you're getting good positional value, you're getting core positions. So I really love the draft in that way. There's a few players I liked, because I was surprised they didn't get a second running back. So I was kind of hoping maybe like a Zemir White would fall and like you take a chance on a guy who's had his ACL problems and you add more depth. Uh, a late round guy I would have liked was Max Borgie from Washington State. He ended up signing with the Colts, I believe, undrafted. But I, they really need a third down back because they. I feel like they kind of been missing that. They have Travis Homer, who's a good pass blocker, but I don't think anyone fears that he'll run or catch. So it's. I feel like they need some more things. I did love the two rookies they drafted in the seventh round, the two wide receivers. I think it's interesting because – I think they really picked them because they know they couldn't attract wide receivers in the undrafted rookie pool because it's like you already have DK Metcalf, you have Tyler Lockett, and the quarterbacks are going to be Drew Locke or Geno Smith. So I don't think you're going to go to an undrafted kid. It's like come out here and try to make the team. So I think they're just like just take two seventh-round wide receivers we like so that way we can fill out the room a little bit. It is so, fascinating the reasoning that goes behind some of these, especially late round, later round picks. Uh, usually the first rounds are pretty obvious, but these later rounds, there's all kinds of a million different factors going on. Um, I had a question I was going to ask you, and, and I completely forgot it, so we won't worry about that one. But uh, looking ahead just a little bit to the 2023 draft, um, you know, Seattle didn't pick a quarterback this year. They've got Drew Locke sitting there at quarterback. I don't know how – people in Seattle feel about it, but the rest of the country uh, thinks that Seattle doesn't really have too much going on at the quarterback position. So it's easy for the rest of us nationally to look ahead and see what looks like a pretty good group of quarterbacks sitting there, especially if you look at C.J. Stroud at the top and and then the, the Alabama quarterback and the Boston College quarterback, maybe the Miami quarterback, but especially with C.J. Stroud sitting there with Ohio State. And it kind of sort of looks like Seattle may struggle to get some wins this year. And, oh, by the way, Seattle's got lots of extra picks next year, and they're good picks. They're not fifth rounders. They are, you know, cream of the crop kind of picks. So what do you think the likelihood right now is, just peaking a year ahead, that Seattle might be – kind of setting themselves up to get a good quarterback next year in the draft. So logically it would make sense that they're completely looking at the 2023 draft because they had four chances to pick other than Kenny Pickett, any quarterback they wanted in this year's draft. They passed on every single quarterback. They didn't even take one rookie quarterback. They signed two undrafted free agent rookie quarterbacks, but to me, they're just like, it's not a priority and it's no big deal. So they're either really comfortable this year or they are looking for next year's draft because next year they have the Denver's Broncos first pick and their first round pick with the Denver's Broncos second round pick and their second round pick. So if they do kind of tank it this year and they end up in the top 10, which they were this year, they had the 10th overall pick that the Jets had. If they got worse, then they would be close to getting a rookie quarterback and then you can use that other first round pick to trade up. Uh, knowing them, though, who knows if they're looking at one kid specifically and they think they can maybe get him. I know for a fact the Seahawks think they're going to be winning this year. So they either believe in Drew Locke or Geno Smith because Pete Carroll in a press conference after they traded Russell Wilson was publicly kind of recruiting Geno Smith to come back. They paid him a little bit of money. They gave him a raise because he did do well last year when Russell Wilson was out in their minds. So I honestly think with Drew Locke and Geno Smith, the Seahawks think if we run the ball and fix the defense, we'll get nine or 10 wins and sneak in the playoffs. And that's actually where their mindset is at. And I don't know what their long-term plans are if they have two late first round picks, but because with Pete Carroll, I don't think the plan is to tank. You don't tank with a 70-year-old coach. So in their minds, they actually think they're going to win. And if that's the case, 
what are their plans for the 2023 draft? Because nationally, yes, it makes sense. If you tank, you'll be in the top five or 10 and you have extra picks to go get that quarterback. But in their minds, they're going to win. So what are their plans next year? Because, and Pete Carroll even said in a press conference uh, not that long ago after the draft, he's not, they're, they'll be looking at quarterbacks this off season, but they're not going to go trade for a quarterback. So that means Baker Mayfield, they're really not that interested in. So it sounds like Cleveland's just stuck with that $18 million contract. So, yeah, I mean, that's where they're at. That's Geno Smith or Drew Locke, maybe unless a Baker gets cut or something, for which would make no sense because he could just play behind uh, Deshaun Watson if he gets suspended, and that way they have a starter for if he does. So, yeah. Logically, it makes sense. Get a rookie quarterback next year. Uh, but they're not tanking, so they're not tanking for that quarterback. The situation in Cleveland just continues to grow more bizarre by the day. Uh, it is a uh, circus because <laughs> it's just, it seems like they really painted themselves in a corner because it's like, all right, we went out all out and got our guy. And then it's like now Baker's like, all right, well, I want out, so I'm going to play all my cards. And now every team's like, well, we have all the leverage, so if, even if we did want them, we're not going to say we want them. We, you can give us a second-round pick to take on all that money. If so. you were somebody who loves awkward, then you you just love the Cleveland situation <laughs> right now because that's uh, all yeah. it is. It just In almost every respect, from the acquisition of Watson and, and all that's going on off the field with him still – to definitely everything that's going on with Baker Mayfield and and uh, continues to go on there in Cleveland. So we'll keep an eye on, on all of that as well. He, yeah, you could say – because Seattle was interested. There was talks back when Baker was picked first overall that, like, there may be a deal where Seattle's sending Russell Wilson to the Browns for that first-round pick, so the first overall. So there is a connection there where the Seahawks were always looking at quarterbacks even with Russell Wilson – but it's like it makes no sense to get a quarterback who costs $20 million who's on one year. If he does well, then you just have to pay a quarterback that you just traded away because you didn't want to pay a quarterback. It's That's where the Seattle situation is. It's like do they honestly think Drew Locke or Geno Smith? It feels like maybe they're just like we just need our Jared Goff and then we will win a Super Bowl. Let's just get some cost control guy and we'll be just fine. Everything you say about Pete Carroll makes sense because Carroll is a competitive guy. He mm-hmm. he built his entire SoCal traditions and his Seattle traditions on just guys competing. That's that's kind of his huge thing. Uh, any chance at all John, John Schneider and the owner are sitting in the back room planning on how to make this roster not very good for next year while Pete Carroll's out front thinking of every single way to make this team good for next year. <laughs> no, because Pete Carroll has a like present. I forget what his term is, but he does have like executive rights where he can pick players. Like, I don't know if it's like pre- team president or something like that. So he is very <laughs> locked in there. It just sounds like the idea was like, we won when Russell was a rookie. He did become great but a rookie is still a rookie. So I think the attitude is like, let's just get back to the young guys that compete. And if we have an okay quarterback and we can run the ball, then it's, we'll prove everyone wrong. And that's where it comes back. It's that mindset. It's not just the players. It is the coach. It is the general manager. They want to prove everyone wrong. And it'll it'll be entertaining at the least, even if they go four and 13, or they do go like nine and eight and somehow sneak into a playoffs. It'll be fun either way to see who was right. I think entertaining is the right word. And, you know, we're going to enjoy watching that. And I do think they're good sooner rather than later. I don't think, I don't think it's five or 10 years before this franchise gets back into some kind of a relevant consistency every single season. I feel like they're trying to look at the landscape of where the NFL is going, where it's cheap quarterbacks with a good team. It's funny because Denver Bronco literally is like, if you think about it, they just became exactly the Denver Broncos where it's like, all right, we got Noah Fant with Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf with Kenneth Walker. It's like, is that really that different from Noah Fant to Sutton to Jared Judy with Melvin Gordon and Javante Williams? It's like, Literally, now the offense is in the same situation. The difference is they're just rebuilding their offensive line with the rookies. 
you're and you're exactly right. And you know, we we're in an era right now, especially in the NFC, but we'll we'll be there very soon, just a season or two in the AFC, where you have a ton of quarterbacks making a boatload of money and soaking up a lot of draft, uh, sorry, of cap space on their mm-hmm. teams, which doesn't make it impossible to win, but it makes it a whole lot harder to win than when they were on their rookie contracts. And that kind of creates this undercurrent of teams who are like, hey, our, our starting quarterback may not be great, but he's cheap. And we just use that cap space to build everything else up and we're good at scheming. So, you know, I, I love the strategy. Who knows if Seattle actually does that all the way or not, but for any team that's doing that, I, I'm very interested in watching them do that because I think it's certainly something that could work. But yeah, it's definitely the tale of two teams, the ones that are going for it and those who are, are not, where it's like, do you want to be the Denver Broncos who don't have a first round pick in the this year or next year and have to pay Russell Wilson $50 million because things are going to get tight there. So it's like you have your windows as like if you hit it, I think that's what Seattle's looking at. They're like, it makes more sense to rebuild with all these ads, all these assets, and we'll have our window for longer instead of trying to aim for a two, three year window with a middle, middle like aged quarterback in his mid thirties. I've I've kind of been waiting on someone to do that this aggressively. Um, Kansas City did something similar to that when they drafted Patrick Mahomes, but I think mm-hmm. they just liked Patrick Mahomes. I don't think they were trying to go cheap. No. I, I've kind of been waiting for somebody to take it, like a, a mid-level quarterback, you know, who's maybe a top 20 guy, but he's, he's certainly not a top 15, uh, but he's cheap, and then build that roster around him. I've kind of been waiting for somebody to do that. So uh, mm-hmm. successfully, I'll put it that way. We'll, we'll see. So. I just think it's a fun situation where it's it's like Denver's like, we're tired of the situation. We have a good team. We just need the quarterback. And Seattle's like, we have an awful team. We have the quarterback. Let's just switch spots. We'll rebuild the team and then be in your position. And it'll be fun to see where this trade, where where both teams end up in five years. They could, they both could have won and they both can lose. And it's scary for both franchises. So it is. And, you know, only one team can win a Super Bowl each year. I had no problem with Denver going ahead and jumping on this because, like you said, the, re- the rest of the roster is basically there. They've struggled so much to draft quarterbacks, just like the Eagles have struggled to draft wide receivers. That's why mm-hmm. they went after A.J. Brown. Um, I-, I get it. Sometimes, no matter how smart you are, you just have a hole or a blind spot, blind spot that you just can't seem to overcome. So, you know, Denver, John Elway picking up uh, – uh, Russell Wilson and the Eagles picking up AJ Brown. I, I get it. I, I see. I see the strategy there. So, yeah. Brandon, we could do this a long time. Yes. We're going to have to get you back on sometime, maybe around training camp, and definitely, start definitely. talking through some of these things. But yeah, um, tell people where all uh, they can find you, um, social media or your writing work. Uh, tell them where they can find your work. All right. Well, you can find my written work at northwestsportsdesk.com. That's where, you know, regional sports site. You can find me on the football side at the Seahawks. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Quasi Brandon. That's Q-U-A-Z-Z-Y Brandon on Twitter. And that's where you can find me. And again, thanks, Ben, for having me because, like you said, we can go on forever. It is just fun seeing how the league, especially this off season, a lot of teams are like, we're going for it. We're not, this is a lot of moving pieces. This guy's going there. We're going to have like two or three major trades before the draft during the first round of the draft. It's, it's very fun off season. That's my favorite part is team building. It's been a, it's been a fascinating off season. You and I could talk about this for four hours. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anybody's going to listen to us for that long. No, we can certainly talk about it for that long. I'd listen to it. I'd re-listen to it. Maybe I missed something in those four hours. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, Brandon, thank you so much. Um, and everybody, thank you so much for listening. This is Sports and Money. We will see you next time. Have a great one. Goodbye.